now with the CRE, the chain link runtime environment, we have uh, an orchestration layer where you can actually write out in code how all those different oracles and all those different chains are defined as a single application. So instead of 20 different pieces of code on 20 different chains and 15 different pieces of code for you know, five different oracles, you now have one piece of code that defines that application. Our next guest is at the center of it all. Chainlink co-founder Sergey Nazarov joins us now. Sergey, it's wonderful to see you again. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being at the conference. Of course. Thank you for having us. Now, just set the stage for us. We're here um, at SmartCon. What do you hope attendees walk away with tomorrow? I, I've been hearing from a lot of folks that they really appreciate the combination of DeFi kind of leaders and builders and institutional leaders and builders mm -hmm. uh, being together in one place. We've been trying to put that together with the SmartCon conference now for some time. And I think we're finally at a point where both of those groups see enough value in, in intermingling and learning and talking to each other. And they understand that they're going to be each other's customers. So the first thing is I would hope that both of those groups come away from this conference with a deeper understanding about how they can work together better. Because the conference is meant you know, to bring people together and, and get them to learn and, and uh, understand each other. Because you know, it's in person. That's, that's much easier to do in person. And then there's a lot of things that got released here at the conference. So the Chainlink runtime environment. We released our white paper on Chainlink privacy and confidential compute. Uh, there's, there's just so many things going on in the Chainlink community now. Uh, but those, those two, I would say, are big highlights for me. You know, Sergey, I want to I take a, a step back. We, you know, we, we've known each other for a bit. Uh, I went back and watched a lot of your early videos about what you guys were trying to do in launching Chainlink. And really the idea of the single source of cryptographic truth and the importance of that. Now, fast forward, you guys are like 80% of the market on the Oracle side. You really sort of delivered on a lot of those promises. So, you know, how do you think about the growth of Chainlink, where you are today and where you're going tomorrow? So the amount of different chains and different Oracles from Chainlink, like data Oracles, identity Oracles, bridging Oracles, compliance Oracles, the amount of systems that now need to be coordinated into a smart contract is m massively growing and has grown already to a point where it's very complex. So the reason it takes many months for institutions or many weeks for DeFi protocols to launch these more advanced smart contracts is because there's so many different systems and so many different chains that they all need to coordinate to make that contract successfully work. And so I, I think the next big frontier for Chainlink is, is two things. Providing all those oracles, all the data oracles, identity oracles, bridging oracles, compliance oracles, AI oracles, because that's a critical component of those advanced contracts. But now with the CRE, the Chainlink runtime environment, we have uh, an orchestration layer where you can actually write out in code how all those different oracles and all those different chains are defined as a single application. So instead of 20 different pieces of code on 20 different chains and 15 different pieces of code for you know, five different oracles, you now have one piece of code that defines that application. And then the really exciting thing that we're hoping to do uh, relatively soon towards the end of this year, early next year, and, and in the, in, throughout the coming year with more features, is allow that single piece of code to also give you privacy. So now you can run this really complicated uh, on-chain application, this really complicated institutional smart contract that operates across 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 chains at launch. It uses all the, the, the highest grade enterprise and other data that you can want to assure all the people that would use it that it's going to work correctly. It can comply with all kinds of regulatory requirements around identity and any number of things so it can work in many different jurisdictions. And the really killer feature I'm, I'm hoping to push forward relatively quickly is it can also do private computations that can then be proven back on chain so that you, you, you have a lot of assurance that the computation was done correctly, just as correctly as if you ran it on a, on a blockchain. So these are the, the, the big next step advancements. And the goal there really is to take these really complex smart contracts that take months to, to create and condense that timeline down to days or hours 
which is which is what I think will will create kind of an explosion in in these more advanced contracts coming to life. Can you give us an example for our audience at home as to what the Chainlink runtime environment will enable? How can sure. how can they make sense of this very technical uh, topic? Sure. So let's say you want to. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Let's say you want to launch a stablecoin. So to launch a stablecoin is relatively complex, but you want your stablecoin to have proof of reserves to have proofs about what's backing the coin, and you want your stablecoin to comply with the requirements of your regulator for who it can be transferred to, and you want your stablecoin to be usable on 50 chains at launch. Mm -hmm. You want all that at launch. Now, you would have to implement all kinds of things to go on those 50 chains to get that compliance to work, to get the proof of reserves to work, or you can write a single piece of code that says, here's my, my stable coin, we'll do proof of reserves, here's the values it checks, here's the API for the reserves for my custodian. Here are my policies that the compliance engine from Chainlink will process against any stable coin transfer. Here are the 50 chains, here's the list of chains that I want CCIP, the cross-chain interoperability protocol, to connect my stable coin into at launch and make it available on those chains at launch, once again, against those reserve conditions and against those compliance conditions. And so now, instead of having to figure out compliance, figure out reserves, figure out how to go on 50 chains, you, you, you wrote a single piece of code. But more importantly than that, what I, what I think is really going to happen is we have, I think, at launch, I think 40 templates. So we, we have a large number of templates. And one of those templates, I think, will be a, a improving, consistently improving launch a stablecoin template or manage a stablecoin template. That's the first example. The second example is fund tokenization. So let's say you want to launch a tokenized fund. You need a transfer agent, and your transfer agent has to have a transfer agency smart contract. You need um, identity verification for all the people that are going to buy into and out of your fund. And you need a, a set of contracts that is going to accept payment for the fund in both uh, ideally on-chain payment like stable coins and off-chain payment like swift payments now you could spend months in some cases years to build this you could go with uh, a provider that's going to take a very large percentage of what it takes for you to make a tokenized fund or you could build a tokenized fund or parts of your tokenized fund within the cre through one piece of workflow code and then the other really critical thing is that all of these use cases right now, the stable coins, the tokenized funds, a whole bunch of other use cases, don't have any privacy. Mm. And once we introduce privacy into the CRE, I think the CRE will become, in many cases, the only way to build some of these things. But, um, you know, privacy, how privacy fits into those two use cases is a longer conversation. <laughs> I was going to ask you, but it feels <laughs> like maybe we don't have time to unpack it right now. That's up to you. <laughs> Sergey, what I love about what you guys are building is whether you're a small business startup and you have a great idea, or frankly, you're a traditional finance company that doesn't exactly know how it wants to play yet on chain, you're really giving them a toolkit to be able to launch quickly, easily, understanding, again, a single coding environment to be able to, to pull all of this together, which I think is what you guys and your team does so well. How do you, when you envision how this is going to be used, the CRE, you know, are there, are there specific use cases? I mean, you mentioned stable coins, you mentioned tokenized funds, but I think it's also really just the core plumbing of how you bring traditional finance on chain that, that this helps to solve. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we, we, we announced two, two key use cases, uh, I think, today here at the conference. One was between the Central Bank of Brazil and the Central Bank of Hong Kong for um, global trade flows around soybeans, but the payments were done uh, over CCIP in tokenized Hong Kong dollars and tokenized uh, reals through the central bank Strex project. And then there was a lot of synchronization through CRE to electronic bill of lading systems, which are critical for trade flows. So that was a trade flow use case where you had to synchronize with existing systems around bills of lading, and you had to synchronize payment in different currencies. That was announced here. The other one that was announced here was with UBS, where actually they used the Chainlink transfer agency standard and those contracts for their tokenized fund to successfully accept payment and mint new tokenized fund shares. So I, I think there's, um, th those are just two that were announced here, I think today. I think there's more stuff that I expect coming up relatively soon. And there's been other stuff in the weeks before this conference that, that we also announced. Um, I think it's just a variety of use cases, right? So tokenized funds 
are different from trade flows, are different from stable coins, are different from tokenized equity, are, you know, it's, these are just different ecosystems and categories of tokenization. But the CRE is built to be flexible enough to enable all of them and to eventually also enable them to interact with each other. Right. So if, 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 you, if you power a stable coin with proof of reserves and, and automated compliance and cross-chain, that should actually make your stable coin more usable in the trade flows and more usable by more tokenized funds. So uh, our hope really is that as you, as you use CRE, you can build better tokenization of, of various parts of the financial system, and that better tokenization starts to interact with the other things built inside of CRE as well. All right, Sergey. Oh, I was just going to say, to, to, to partner up on that, I think what I like about what you're saying is you think about supply chain, which again is a very complex problem, and you think about stable coins, which is a very complex problem, and really you're saying these are Lego pieces mm -hmm. that we can put together and make those happen. I'm just, we have a few, minutes, a few seconds left. I don't want to get into privacy, but I think what is the importance of privacy in these systems for the future? It's, it's a hard requirement for a lot of data to be made available to chains. We know that from the many years we've worked with the world's leading data providers. So Standard & Poor's, FT, FTSE Russell, TradeWeb all announced with us in the last few months through Datalink, putting their, chain, their data on chain through Chainlink's Datalink. Um, we know from our conversations with them over many years and other data providers that the ability to preserve the privacy of data while making it usable on a chain is a hard requirement. So at the minimum, you get a lot of data on chain that you wouldn't before, and that, uh, and that data enables a lot more use cases. Beyond that, it starts to get really detailed into each specific transaction. For example, in trade finance and in uh, global trade flows, you legally can't conduct a transaction if it discloses certain details publicly yeah. about, about the, the trade flow. Mm -hmm. So in that case, certain transactions or categories of goods couldn't be transacted in a public way. They'd only be able to be transacted in a private way on the trade flow example. Um, on the tokenized fund example, a lot of that is about market m dynamics and people not wanting to know, other people not wanting to know what they are doing, that right. type of thing. I know we're running out of time, but I got, I'm going to ask you one quick last question. Sure. In the world that you're building towards, dig a little bit deeper into that for me. How do privacy and transparency coexist? Well, the, the reality is that the level of extremely public transparency with the type of selective privacy that I'm describing don't coexist. Okay. What, what is possible is to prove that a transaction happened under a certain set of conditions, that those conditions are legal and that those conditions are not taking more money than they're supposed to or they're not, they're not malicious. So that level of proof will remain at a completely public level. Then you get to a place where you have a kind of selective privacy, where you have the on-chain transaction, you have the transaction within, part of the transaction within CRE that can selectively prove to regulators, to the other parties in the transaction. So not to everybody, but to the others in the transaction that really need to know, frankly. The, the rest of the world doesn't really need to know. The ones in the transaction are the ones that need proof that the transaction completed correctly. And so you have an ability to do this kind of selective privacy with cryptographically guaranteed transactions still. So the transactions are just as bulletproof as blockchain transactions in the completely public sense. But you, you can't eliminate certain public disclosure and still have public disclosure. Mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's not really compatible. Uh, that's just, you know, paradoxical. But you, 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 you can disclose the part of the thing that the public needs to know. So you, you, you can disclose that this is the amount of total value or the amount of bad debt, or not bad debt, or the amount of debt that a protocol has. Mm -hmm. But you might not disclose exactly who that debt is from. You see? Mm -hmm. And that might be, you know, something that the protocol wants to do. And then all of the users of the protocol can make an informed decision about do they want to use that part of the protocol or another part of the protocol. But I think it'll definitely accelerate the massive amount of value that can flow in. So I think the benefits of privacy far, far outweigh, you know, any of these issues. Sergey, thank you so much for joining us at My the pleasure. desk. Thank you for having us here at the conference. I, we're going to see you back here again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Thank you.